We receive a whole spectrum of light rays from the sun, well known as electromagnetic waves. We have learned how to use many of the different frequencies in everyday life, as well as in advanced technology devices. One group of these frequencies is much less understood than the others. So it could be said that there is a hole in our knowledge that this video will address. It turns out that this band has very useful properties. So we will learn what it is, how it interacts with the molecules we live with and use. Here are the light frequency bands that we are familiar with and some of the uses we put them to. Of course, making use of these electromagnetic energies requires that we understand how they work, their advantages, disadvantages, and dangers. Visible light is the most familiar to humans, while infrared and microwaves have even become common for heating and cooking in our homes. You can divide up the EM spectrum into those energies that ionize and change atoms and molecules, and those that just manipulate them. Visible light causes molecules to move or translate through space, which causes the collisions that we call heat. At the higher frequencies, ionization will produce enough energy to create chemical reactions and bond rearrangements. Infrared energies will cause chemical bonds to vibrate, bend, and stretch, as seen below. What about microwaves? The frequency of microwaves creates heat by rotating chemical bonds. Bond rotation. That's what fills the hole I'm talking about. Let's look closer, because there are some unusual advantages to microwaves that are also not in the books. How exactly do these electromagnetic fields cause molecules to move? Water has a strong permanent dipole charge, so you can actually bend a stream of water using a simple magnet. We also know that a microwave field affects water's dipole, which is how we quickly boil water at home. But it isn't just water that heats in our microwave ovens, but food molecules too, because they have lots of permanent dipoles. So infrared is a higher frequency that causes those electrons to vibrate the atoms in a molecule. At the lower frequency of microwaves, whole molecules are rotated around the bonds between the atoms. Notice that the short wavelength of infrared only penetrates materials to a depth of millimeters, but microwaves longer wavelength penetrates whole meters. This will become important later when we learn how microwaves can be uniquely useful. So why hasn't microwave energy been used for more than just boiling water and reheating pizza? It's because microwaves cause metals to arc. And even with the turntable, it still has really poor uniformity. Well, how about combining several microwave magnetrons so you can get a uniform field? Well, that's been tried, but it was not uniform enough for industrial use, was expensive, and still caused arcing. Up to 20 sources and two different frequencies were not enough to be uniform. Several experiments were made using a very tiny cell to see if even a small volume could still be uniformly heated with microwaves. Actually, still not uniform in a one millimeter cube. It wasn't until 1990 that a really practical microwave field was generated. Instead of just one frequency, 4,096 frequencies were sequentially swept over one-tenth of a second. Each pulse only lasts 25 microseconds before the frequency is changed for the next pulse. This is too little time for an arc to be generated on a metal surface. Not only that, but the uniformity of the microwave field is nearly molecular. You can see in this infrared photograph that this silicon wafer is uniformly hot from edge to edge. In a vertical stack of 25 wafers and measured at 17 points on each wafer, 
the uniformity of cure of the polymer surface was plus or minus 1.7%. So now we can use this variable frequency technique to heat molecules uniformly and safely. With this large uniform field of VFM, let's try to understand the science of microwaves. In an oven, collisions with hot air cause molecules to randomly move by translation. Whether a chemical reaction will occur depends on how hot the air is, or how often collisions happen, and whether the molecules are at just the right angle to form a new set of bonds. Within a microwave field, the molecules are sent spinning and colliding much more often. If we look at the classic Arrhenius rate equation, the pre-exponential factor A is a constant for any one chemical reaction. But if we look closer, A is really a combination of the collision frequency and the form factor. Since there are more collisions in a microwave field, and the probability is higher that a collision will be at just the right form to react, then we now see why microwaves are always thought of as heating faster. It's just basic kinetics. So that explains speed. But there's much more to microwaves. Much of the practical chemistry around us is actually polymer chemistry. Let's look at the chemistry of adhesives and coatings for an example of the unique properties of microwaves. Here's how a liquid epoxy resin made up of small molecules that can be heated or cured to form a three-dimensional mesh of chains that is a strong solid polymer adhesive. Notice that halfway through the process, a continuous backbone linkage is formed quickly from one side to the other. If you have used epoxy glues, you may have seen the cloudy appearance of this gel that actually has the properties of a solid. Not surprisingly, in a microwave field, the first part of a polymer reaction is much faster to the gel point. But unlike normal heating, the microwave field forces the long chains in the gel to rotate as well, sweeping up the rest of the molecules to fully connected in faster time. This also means that less temperature is needed to make all these chemical reactions complete. This is a unique way to lower a polymer cure temperature while ensuring complete cure. Lower temperature cure of polymers is not possible any other way. This has been a game changer for some applications that are temperature sensitive. Here's another unique characteristic of microwave heating. Hot air heats a material progressively from the top or outside gradually to the bottom. Since the heat has to penetrate through the previously cured top layer, often the bottom or inside is not cured well. This can lead to stress, unreliability, and adhesion issues. As an EM wave at the speed of light, microwaves instantly heat the entire thickness equally well up to two meters. But wait, what if the sample is thin, like a coating? Surely an oven would heat a very thin coating quickly in all dimensions. In a published study, it was found that a polyamide coating only 7 microns thick was not heated uniformly from top to bottom in an oven, but completely cured from top to bottom by microwaves. VFM fields have nearly molecular level uniformity. Microwaves are also very selective in what they heat. Glass and ceramics are transparent to microwaves. Plastics and rubbers become microwave transparent after curing. Organic and polymer resins are very absorptive, as we have seen. Doped silicon absorbs, but only about 1% as well as organics. Metals depend on their thickness, with details in the next slide. 
Thick metals, more than a few microns, reflect microwaves because the first layer of electrons quickly pass on heat to the bulk of the metal, leaving the surface to reflect back the microwaves. At the thickness of a few microns, the electrons will absorb the energy and heat that thin metal layer. As mentioned above, no arcing will occur with VFM. At thinner layers below a few microns, the electrons don't have time to produce heat, so the metal is transparent to microwaves. Since electronic devices are made up of mostly thick or very thin metal layers and glass and ceramics, they don't heat in a microwave field. My own cell phone barely got warm when I tried to heat it with VFM and it's still working years later. This is what a typical VFM run looks like. The analog microwave field is converted into a pulsed digital field. This allows the temperature of the sample in red to be controlled directly and accurately in a closed loop circuit by increasing or decreasing the power in green. More power is needed to ramp up, but then the power drops to just maintain the program temperature. Since each pulse cycle lasts only one-tenth of a second, the sample temperature can be maintained plus or minus one degree. Measuring the sample temperature can be remote or by direct contact. In a standard oven, the air temperature is controlled with the assumption that the sample temperature will be similar. In fact, chemical reactions often include an additional exothermic heat generation that can affect additional components nearby. In this example, the intended oven temperature was set to 60 C, but a chemical exotherm pushed the sample up to 97 C for a while. On the right, the digital VFM system controls the sample temperature as set within one degree Celsius. These two graphs are actual from identical samples. Exotherms are often not known about and not planned for. If you watch closely at a boiling pot of water, you will first see a group of micro bubbles appear, then disappear because their vapor pressure is too low, so they're crushed. As the true boiling temperature is reached, larger bubbles with higher internal pressure are generated that can now rise to the surface and evaporate. With VFM, the liquid surfaces of the initial micro bubbles are directly heated and expanded at that lower temperature. They rise to the surface so boiling can smoothly and efficiently evaporate both water and solvents at lower temperatures. Do some chemicals react faster than others in microwaves? Once again, we look at the example of the epoxy cure because it's used very often in many applications. Not surprisingly, stronger amines will increase the speed of reaction. Total polarizability should be better for microwaves to spin the molecules. Rotational entropy usually only affects chemical reactivity by a few percent. Here's an example of a molecule with flexibility on the left and rigidity on the right. The left side has high entropy and the right side has zero entropy. So molecules can be designed for whatever amount of rotational entropy you need. But here's the data. Yes, amine basicity is effective, but polarizability is not. That's odd. It turns out that rotational entropy is the best way to speed up a microwave reaction. Predicting which starting materials will maximize reaction speed is now easy. To get a low oven cure temperature, there are some rules to follow but you end up with low thermal stability. For a high glass transition temperature, you need a high cure temperature. 
even higher than that transition temperature. We've seen that what matters for cure temperature is what happens at the end of the process when the viscosity is highest. To design a low VFM cure temperature with high thermal stability, the data shows that there's a strong dependence between basicity and polarizability. This graph shows that either low basicity and high polarizability or high basicity and low polarizability works best. Either choice gives a lower cure temperature than with an oven. There is no effect from rotational entropy. This actually makes sense because in the crowded final cure stages, there isn't as much room for rapid rotation. But microwaves still force the dipoles to move and the reactions to complete. Here's a comparison that shows chemical changes that would lower the cure temperature but keep thermal stability. There's a lot more to learn about microwave chemistry. So microwaves have unusual properties. Faster heating at lower temperatures is pretty impressive. But we've seen that many other properties are very unique too. Here are some common reasons that microwaves have been put into production lines. Material selectivity, it doesn't just heat everything. First we see an assembly with an adhesive in red along with some temperature sensitive parts that don't absorb microwaves. The adhesive is cured in black quickly without heating these sensitive parts. Note that the microwaves pass right through other assembly parts. Having a large VFM field, cubic meters, can uniformly and selectively cure adhesives on trays of many parts without producing the stress that a hot air oven typically produces. Polyamide coatings on silicon wafers can be cured quickly at lower temperatures, even in a vacuum. You know those invisible dog fences that are buried wires? By putting unconnected wires and circuit boards, microwave antennas are created that will heat and cure epoxy encapsulations on devices with perfect shapes. Slurry films that need to be smoothly and uniformly dried can be processed faster at lower temperatures. The film thickness can be doubled because remember, the expanding microbubbles continue all the way to the surface. We have used epoxies as a polymer example, but VFM has been found useful for polyurethane adhesives, biological warming of tissues, chemical synthesis, silicon dopant anneal and regrowth, anthrax detoxification, and solder reflow. So it seems that microwaves have been underappreciated, but that is changing. The more we learn about microwaves, the more useful they seem to be. Now you can ask your teachers in class, what happens to molecules in a microwave field? Bet they won't know.